Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, April 15th. It's tax day, and really there's two things that are certain in life, death and taxes, uh, probably the death of the Anglican Communion, and Uncle Sam wanting all of your money. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today really is April 15th, 2016. Sometimes, occasionally, not very frequently, in fact, in 224 episodes, it's probably happened three times, but Kevin may, in an unscripted moment, misstate something. And I think a couple weeks ago, we were talking about uh, uh, the Episcopal Church going to Lusaka, and I had mentioned that uh, the primates said they can't go to these meetings, and that's not what the primates said. The primates said they can attend, they just can't have a vote. Um, They can't be in leadership positions or uh, speak in any doctrinal fashion for the Anglican Communion. And I apologize deeply to the 30 or some people who wrote me to remind me that that's what they said. I would like to remind all of you, this is an unscripted show, and any time George and I happen to have to record after 5 p.m., that's going to happen. It's just the way it is, and that was last week's show. Um, It's now 1.14 p.m., so we should be fairly accurate, George. Let's go on to the news. I talked about Lusaka. Um, They had the meeting uh, uh, of the ACC in Lusaka, ACC 16, uh, a bunch of deputies from uh, the promises around the world flew in, but there were some important ones that were missing, George. Well, Kevin, before we even go there, this week has been the most fantastic news week in Anglicanism that I can think of in years and years and years. We know what happened at 8.15, but we can't talk about it because we can't prove it. And this being the United States, we have to be very careful because we can libel people. We can allude to it, though. We will allude to it. We can allude to it and make arch references. Yes. We know what's happened. The Archbishop of Canterbury discussed his parentage, whether or not he's a bastard. And I'm not talking about his moral characters, but his legitimacy. His legitimacy, yes. That was a front-page continuing story there was forgery and fraud imagine that amongst bishops of the anglican communion now usually usually um you know kevin you know usually kevin about on a thursday afternoon friday morning i'm scratching my head thinking okay i gotta start writing for next week and i'm um, okay the bell ringers the saint swithin's celebrating 75 years and you know that sometimes is the top story mm-hmm. I'm, I'm spoiled for choice this week. It, it, it's really hard. And, you know, we could start our own series called Lambeth Abbey. And, and nobody would believe that can't happen. No, it really does happen in the church. Um, it, it's been something else. I was uh, at the new Wineskins conference when a lot of these breaking news stories uh, happened. And people were tapping me on the shoulder. Did you hear about th- Yes. Is it true? Oh, I know it's true, but I can't tell you. (laughs) So we're going to tell you what we can tell you about 815, um, the forgery that happened at the uh, uh, ACC, and we'll discuss a little bit about Justin Welby. Um, And you know, Kevin, we are lying liars who lie. That is the formal position of the Anglican Consultative Council staff. (laughs) We've probably missed... Probably three or four stories we got wrong in in 224 episodes. That's not too bad when you consider, you know, most major news outlets do it every night. So uh, I think we're batting at least 1,000. No, no. Well, Kevin, we are batting 1,000 because though we may have made minor errors of garbling names and dates and things of, of second or third order, the original stories that we've brought out, not one of them has been shown to be false. Going back to the AMIA blow-up, where we were accused of making things up. Uh, well, no, where to begin? Yeah, I don't. Okay. To well, most recently, the uh, we had the exclusive on the primates communicate. Oh no, it's not that. Well, yes, it was. Way today. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the uh, the latest thing we got in trouble for, and that was the forgery story um, coming out of the ACC. Um, 
a lot of uh, provinces, well, not a lot, some provinces didn't show up to the meeting. Uh, most sudden, a little delegation of uh, um, their deputies off to the ACC, but uh, let's go through them. Uh, Meneer didn't send a delegation. Uh, no, Meneer did not go himself okay. to the standing committee. There's only one delegate from the Middle East, Michael Lewis, Bishop of Cyprus in the Gulf, and he went. Okay. So, so the archbishop didn't go, but the bishop went. Uh, Nigeria? Nobody went. Uganda? Nobody went. Rwanda? Nobody went. Um, Kenya? <gasps> Nobody was supposed to go. <laughs> okay. There's a story there. Um, as I arrived down at New Wineskins at Ridgecrest, uh, we had learned that the a small delegation from Kenya had uh, shown up at in Lusaka. And uh, it, when we inquired why... We found out that there may be un they're under false pretenses. What well, what's the story there, George? Well, the head of the de Kenyan delegation is the Bishop of Nairobi, Joel Waweru, mm -hmm. and he was elected to that post a year or two ago by the Kenyan House of Bishops, as were the other two delegates: one bishop, one priest, one lay man or woman. And Bishop Waweru has been part of the Indaba process. He, uh, they have this Canadian-led Bishops and Dialogue group. He goes to the Indaba conferences. He is one of these people who takes money to fly around the world to meet with American and Canadian bishops and say, though we disagree, we're still brothers under the skin. And in the past, he's been dressed down pretty sharply by Archbishop Wabukala. Mm -hmm. Well, Archbishop Wabukala is in the north of Kenya. He's trying to mediate a dispute between farmers and ranchers. Um, sounds like the movie Shane, but they have that problem in Kenya. Pastoralists versus farmers. And he gets a call from, Archbishop, from Bishop Uweru saying, can we meet because I really want to talk about this meeting in Lusaka. I think we should go. And Archbishop Wabakala says, well, I can't make it, but I'll send my deputy and you gather the delegation, and I'll send my deputy, and I'll talk to you over the, my cell phone, and I'll explain to you why the House of Bishops has said we're not going to go. So the meeting's held, and the, the bishop calls Archbishop, Wab uh, Archbishop Wabukala, and the first thing the bishop says is, I found a stranger in your office. It was the stranger. It's the aid Archbishop Wabukala had sent. The first thing Archbishop Waweru does is basically play the ethnic card, the race card, whatever tribal card you want, yeah. and kicks out the aid and bullies the bishop and the, uh, the, the priest and the lay member and then says, here's what we've decided and here's this letter we've written that we'd like you to sign. And they begin to read it to Archbishop Wabukala. And he hears the first part of it, and it says, we're against the Episcopal Church, we're supporting the Global South, we're fully backing GAFCON, but he doesn't hear the conclusion. And so Archbishop Wabakala says, don't do anything. I'll be in the office tomorrow morning, I'll look at it then, but I can't hear you over the cell phone. It's, it's not working. Uh, calling Northern Kenya is not... You know, yeah, you know, some technologies have not reached Northern uh, Kenya. Well... What happened? The Archbishop comes in the next day and he finds on the website of the Anglican Church of Kenya is a letter with his signature. It's the letter that was read to him that he didn't hear. And the letter says that I, Archbishop Wapakula, have changed my mind and now want my team to go. Even though we are against tech, we're pro-Global South, we're pro-GAFCON. And Bishop Uweru took a digital signature, or as Bishop Wabukala told us, a rubber stamp, mm -hmm. and signed that letter without Archbishop Wabukala's permission. Then gave that signed letter to the members of the delegation and says, oh, look, the Archbishop's changed his mind. We're off. That was an... Now, we can say this politely and say that was an unauthorized use of the Archbishop's signature and an awful unauthorized reversal of the Anglican Church of Kenya and the Archbishop's clearly stated position. Or we can call it what you would call it, fraud and forgery. I mean, if he did the same and went to the bank to take money out, he would be in jail right now. So you call it what you want, uh, a misunderstanding or fraud. So. Well, actually, Kevin, it's, it's more than that. It's If I said to you, Kevin, 
I really need you to loan me some money, give me some money. And and I tell you why I need it. And you say, well, let, let's talk about it when we see each other next. But I hear what you're saying, but I'm not ready to do anything. And you walk into the office and you find that I have forged your signature and gone ahead and taken the money out. I mean, it's not, in other words, this. I would laugh no. at you because Uncle Sam took it all. So. But okay, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Now, why would this guy do this? Yeah. And, well, there's the Archbishop Wabukala did not want to speculate because he doesn't want to spark a civil war. But Bishop Waweru was running for the position of primate in the May election for the next Archbishop of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And if he is shown to be the strong man, if there's a nice little palace coup there where Kenya goes like Tanzania, it's decapitated and the province flips from Gafcon to anti-Gafcon because the leader at the top's taken out. Yeah, that's what happened in Tanzania, what, two years ago. Um, and it's certainly something that can happen in Kenya. It can actually happen in many different uh, of the uh, East Coast African provinces. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot for people who need money to take money. No, so Archbishop Wabukala told us that he, this was done to defy me, my authority, and to justify... Uh, the trip by the delegation to Kenya, uh, the, fr from the Kenyan delegation to Lusaka. Well, we started running these stories, and these stories were based on our conversations mm -hmm. and copies of the documents uh, that were uh, given to us by the province of Kenya. Well, the chairman of the Anglican, cons uh, the general secretary of the Anglican Consultative Council released a blistering statement that without naming names, he denounced Archbishop uh, Munir Nice as basically being a fool and ignorant for not being able to understand pure legal English language. Uh, and then he denounced the uh, Ugandans and Nigerians and Rwandans of exaggerating the problems within the communion. And then he denounced Archbishop Wabukala and I guess us for being li lying liars who have have said scurrilous lies, that this was all made up. Now, I contacted uh, Archbishop uh, Adaiwa Faron's press officer saying, did you talk to Nigeria, uh, to the Kenyans, before you labeled them liars? And they, because we've talked to them, and this is a statement we've got. And they said, well, the, Adaiwa Faron is going to stand by what he said. He's not backing down. So, Man, this is a lot of fun. This is a lot uh, of fun. From a reporter's perspective, but we've got fraud. We've got forgery. We've got a guy who's the Secretary General of the Anglican Consultative Council calling primates fools and liars. This is not a healthy atmosphere for a church to grow and thrive in. Lambeth Abbey. I know. Watch the next episode. Uh, now, we also, at, when I was uh, down at the New Wineskins Conference... There was another uh, uh, report issued by Justin Welby talking about his uh, parents. And um, f we need to back up and talk a little bit about the, the, the British press. Um, there's press all around the world, and it's neat to break a story and do your investigative reporting and um, you know work your sources and stuff like that. Most of the British press don't do that. Um, when my first time I went to England was in 2007 or 2008 and, um, I was struck by, uh, they were still having kids handing out papers at the subway stops at the, at the metro stops, free papers. And they're just trying to get copy out, copy out, copy out. And the competition in, uh, uh, England to get your newspaper read is fierce. And that kind of produces... I, I Yes. I would only say, Kevin, the British press is the best in the world and the worst in the world simultaneously. Right. And so we get to the point where you need copy. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate. It has to be 100% um, consumable. And so from time to time, people hear rumors and they'll write down in the little book, I need to follow up on this. Well, somebody had heard the rumor that Justin Welby's father was not his father and was probably the secretary, the private secretary to Winston Churchill. Sir Anthony Montague Brown. Whatever his name may be. 
and it probably sat in this reporter's little notebook for months and months and he's reviewing his notebook and says i need to call and follow up on this guess what happens we find out uh through justin welby that his dad was not his dad this is a remarkable story, and it sparked some reactions that I think we need to stop and think about. Mm -hmm. First off, there was an outpouring of respect for Archbishop Welby because the day before the Daily Telegraph published the story where Archbishop Welby's father was not Gavin Welby, his mother's husband, but uh, his mother's co-worker. His mother was a, private sec was a secretary to Winston Churchill. His father, his biological father, was the principal private secretary, sort of the head assistant. Sure. The day before this was published, Justin Welby puts out a personal statement on his parentage, where it starts off by saying, my mother and father were, were terrible alcoholics, and uh, but my, my father has since died of alcoholism and, and smoking, and my mother, however, has been dry for 50, 40 years, and I love her. She's a wonderful woman. Oh, but by the way, she had a sexual affair shortly before I was, she was married to my father, and I am the product of that affair. Mm -hmm. But then he had a Christian hook at the end saying, but Jesus is my God and Father in heaven and biology doesn't matter, it's faith that matters. So it ended on a nice note and there was an outpouring of sympathy for the Archbishop of Canterbury that the nasty British press would investigate his parentage and embarrass his dear mother. Not quite. Not quite. So what's the backstory? Well, the Press Gazette that's the trade newspaper for the British press, interviewed the author of the Telegraph story, uh, Charles Moore, his last name's Moore, former editor of the Telegraph. He had heard the rumors, and he went to Justin Welby to say, look, this is what I'm hearing. What can you tell me? Now, why did he go, even go to Welby in the first place? Why, if we had no stories about Rowan Williams' father, uh, George Carey's father, Michael Curry's father, Catherine Jeffords' fo Shorey's father, you know, why all of a sudden Justin Welby's father is of interest to anybody? Well, Welby has used his father's struggle with alcoholism as part of his life story. He's spoken about it frequently. And so the Telegraph decided, well, this is of public interest that the guy that he's been pushing forward really isn't there, isn't the man that everybody thinks he is. So they went to Welby and said, what do you know? And Welby, Moore said, could have killed the story right there. If he basically said, go away, the story would have died. And in fact, what Moore said was that Welby said, well, this is interesting. Let's do a DNA test and find out. Moore said, do you want to talk to your mother first? No, let's do the test first. So the test, and he did the test with the Daily Telegraph supervising it, mm -hmm. seeing it, and found out, sure enough, Gavin Welby is not Justin Welby's father. And then they told mom. Yeah. Now, okay, this, there is a great deal of truth coming. I, I'm going to be un wildly unpopular, and I'm going to get cut from somebody's Christmas card list when I say this. Okay. This, Welby had the power to kill this story, but instead chose not to. And, 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 I don't wish to play psychological games and do psychoanalysis, but what purpose does it serve other than to humiliate his 80 plus year old mother? I mean, you know, the Telegraph was not going to run the story unless it had proof because there are libel laws. Welby cooperated. Welby's the one that said, let's do it, let's go with it. Welby's the one who didn't talk to his mother after, until after the story's ready to break. Yeah, she, and she had to issue her own statement and uh, basically de denied remembering anything. Um, but, you know, that is one of the, the things that happens when you have to uh, uh, answer to the press, uh, which you, you know, he felt he had to do uh, in England. Um, okay, Kevin, but see, here, here's the thing. Hmm? You don't have to answer to the press. You and I know that you don't have to answer to the press. Well, and I'll tell you, give it a wonderful example. What happened at 8.15? Mm -hmm. We think we know. We've talked to insiders. We think we understand what is happening. We've gone officially to Neva Ray Fox, the press officer for the Episcopal Church Center, and she has said, 
we are not going to talk about this. We are going to move forward. We're going to respect people's privacies and so on and so forth. We can't move until we get somebody who wants to stand up and say, this was done to me and that's the reason why this happened. Well, the we've contacted the people who were fired and they've not wanted to talk. It's a dead story. It's not totally dead. I mean, yes, we know what happened. Um, we our sources are pretty much impeccable, but they won't go on the record. Um, and we're talking about uh, Stacy Sauls and uh, his underlings who were let go last week. McDonald um, and Baumgart. Okay, they got fired for a reason. Um, Two and, were fired, and Sauls was basically edged yeah, out. Edged just out. so that we don't overstate. We don't want to overstate things. this. We don't. I don't want another Kevin. You were wrong again. Email this week. And so we're to the point, like, what do we do? We we know what happened. We asked many people at Tech to confirm or deny, and nobody denies, but nobody confirms. Um, They say, listen, this is a time for healing. And, but you guys, this is, this reads like, um, oh, what's that uh, show on AMC? Mad Men. Mad Men. This this reads like Mad Men. I mean, you guys, this is, this is. Tech Abbey, eight fifteen Abbey. I mean, this is good stuff. And um, we, when we get somebody who's willing to go on the record, we will discuss um, the salacious stuff that happened at eight fifteen. Until then, we have to honor uh, slander and libel laws, uh, <clears throat> unlike some presses around the world. And, and and also, there's the the question is: Is this something that should be newsworthy? In other words, uh, do you report every scandal? even if the scandal is of private individuals who have no um, public position, it doesn't influence their lives. The story of, you know, the Telegraph made the decision uh, to run with the story that it found about Welby's purported illegitimacy. Mm-hmm. Now, from a te- and it took some while. In other words, this wasn't a week-long story because one of the things we've learned is that the lawyers of the Church of England had to investigate uh, does this make uh, Justin Welby illegitimate? Because if he's illegitimate, he couldn't be the Archbishop of Canterbury. Therefore, his acts as Archbishop are, are illegal. Therefore, women bishops, women bishops shouldn't have happened. Oh, my gosh. Now, in other words, we got to roll back all these women bishops because of it's an affair and his mother had in the 1950s. Oh. Well, they found because legal paternity is not the same thing as biological paternity and so on oh, and so forth. Yeah. So maybe there's an issue there with Justin Welby. But the question is, Mrs. Welby, or her name is Williams now, mm-hmm. has been basically dragged through the mud to what purpose? No, I, I agree that uh, um, where Justin Welby probably had tactically his best week, um, his mother did not. Um, he got much sympathy for his... Uh, um, uh, letter explaining what happened um nobody felt uh uh like he had to deceive them and uh it was a, a good week for Welby, a bad week for his family see as a parish priest you're um you're gonna hear these sorts of things almost every day every week uh, family skeletons family struggles family shame and embarrassment and I guess where I'm going with this is is that there's some things that should remain firmly tied up in the closet. Don't let the skeletons out. Let the dead be dead. Um, and I would, well, Justin Welby may, chose the course that this story took. He is responsible for its being out there, no one else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the decision he made. I won't second guess him. If I were in that position, I wouldn't have done that. I need to call my mom. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> all right we've uh we've taken you out almost 24 minutes now that's a little longer than our average episode but it was the but greatest folks, it was the greatest else, yes we're talking about illegitimacy <laughs> fraud forgery <laughs> bastards that we we can we can say words that we discipline our children for yes. saying out loud we're talking in the news i know it's like another week with bill clinton oh thank god that's over i'm kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 224 of Anglican Unscripted.